and they just keep coming in. I think what's going to happen is what has been happening lately, Kent, is people sign in sometimes 10, 15 minutes late because they're teaching classes and they're trying to, to rush to get here. But regardless, sure. we want to have the digital footprint no matter who's signing in or not signing in. Hundreds and thousands and millions of people will view this later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was oh, sorry go ahead go ahead no you go ahead Ken. What were you? Uh, I, I had the uh, I had the opportunity not too long ago to speak with um, uh, Sifu Dwight Woods on his I Love Jeet Kune Do podcast and he made the he made a great joke he said you know says uh, millions of people are going to see this we're only we're only second to Joe Rogan and and he said it with such so I knew he was joking but he said it was such confidence for a half a second I, I had to stop and wonder <laughs> I was like how big is he <laughs> <laughs> okay on that note i'm gonna pass it off to sean benson and get him to take it away Lead all right thank you sensei dofa and uh welcome everybody who's watching welcome to this week's edition of punch kick choke chat i'm so excited for tonight's guest um obviously i get excited for everybody but i i spent the day looking at our guests um some of his videos online and reading about him and you know, we're just so lucky to have so many martial artists across North America that we've connected with and eventually we'll go global. But uh, I'm really excited to ask questions, but much more excited to listen tonight. It's, it's, it's a really great uh, thing we have for you tonight. Um, but as with every week, I get the absolute pleasure uh, of introducing Sensei Nicholas Suino. Um, you know, I was thinking of different ways. I mean, first off, as I mention every week, he is in uh, eighth Dan in Iaido. He's a sixth Dan in Jiu Jitsu, a sixth Dan in Judo. Um, the big thing for me is that, you know, not everybody's rank is real. And I don't mean they didn't get the rank. I mean, the rank may not mean um, what it might mean to someone else or what someone else's rank might mean. But Sensei Suino is somebody who I've had the honor of training with over at least 20 years. And this is a guy who pushes harder than I do, harder than anyone I know, except for maybe some people on this call, and they push each other. And I say that because when I think about, wow, that's what a six stand looks like for him, because that's my next rank. It's a very motivating and a very scary thing for how much work I have to put in. And I just want to thank you for that, Sensei Suino, because, you know, within our legacy, Shore and Root Club, we're very motivating to each other. But I just want you to know, when I think about you and your martial arts, it's intensely motivating. We've mentioned the Crucible online and Sensei Suino uh, does this 12 hour event called the Crucible and it includes grappling, it includes motivational work, it includes judo, it includes sword and it includes karate and it's 12 hours of uh, you know 8,000 calorie burning work. So Sensei Suino, I just wanna say thanks for the motivation. Um, you know, I think of you as a, as a teacher and a, and a sensei first and a motivator and friend second. How are you doing tonight? Doing great, thank you. It's always a nice boost to have you introduce me. Um, let's never change the order of this. Ah. <laughs> Although, to be fair, uh, Randy's not bad at introducing people as well. Um, thanks so much, Sean. Um, yeah. uh, I don't know why, but today I, I um, hearkened back to a, uh, an evening, uh, I can't remember what, three, four years ago, we're all sitting on the deck at my house um, after a long day of training. I don't know if that was after the crucible, um, but I remember, you know, a bunch of you folks from Canada were, were down and you were among them. And we all sat on the deck uh, until the wee hours and, you know, watched the moon come up. Um, and I don't know where that memory came from, but it just popped up as I was thinking about the call tonight. I know um, the night. It was wonderful, Sensei. So there's no question that um, you, we've trained together for a long time and had a lot of great shared experiences. It falls to me to um, to introduce Sensei Randy Dauphin and uh, um um, interestingly, I was going to uh, mention the Crucible because it's something Kent has been involved in. It's something Randy's been involved in. Um, there are a lot of martial artists we know, and we all know that um, one of the criteria we look for when we ask, when we think about guests for this, is that there are, pe there are people who are serious about martial arts and likely to be involved in and serious about martial arts for their entire lifetime. That certainly describes Randy to a T. Um, uh, we've been training together at least 25 years, and um, he's been gracious enough to come down and, and participate in the Crucible and help with it, which just makes it better. Um, if you haven't, and I know everybody in the Legacy Clubs has knows what it means to train hard, and I know everybody that trains at KSK Martial Arts knows what it's like to train hard, uh, but not everybody in the martial arts world knows that. And um, one thing the Crucible does is it lets you know it's a gut check right it lets you know 
uh, that you can do it, that it's not easy, um, but the benefits are, are huge. And so um, uh, everybody on the call should know that, that, um, that Randy's come down, helped out with that, and not only uh, delivered some great educational material, but also participated in it from moment one to the very end. And I think very close to our 12, I remember distinctly um, doing grappling with Randy, which was kind of cool because it was not his comfort zone. Um, and I had a little smile on my face because now I think he knows what it's like for me to, to do karate sparring with him. <laughs> Either way, it's, it's deep water, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, Sensei. Yeah, I can uh, I can lift quite a bit of weight off of my chest, way more than you weigh. But there's no way I could get you fucking off of me when you're on top of me. It's just impossible. It's, that might you might as well weigh the same amount as my car. Like it's, <laughs> it might have something to do with the fact that you had just trained for 11 hours and 43 minutes before we did. That. <laughs> Were you going to say anything, Sensei, about Ken? And your, I was uh, indeed. If this is my moment, I This will. is your moment. Please. Yeah, so I'm super, super excited as well to have Kent on here. I thought of him immediately. And, you know, we got a long roster of people that we want on the show and that have wanted to be on the show. But I wanted to get Kent on fairly early um, because he's become a, a, you know, really significant friend and, and uh, martial arts compadre over the years. So we were discussing before the call started. Um, Kent, I don't even remember how we met before I had the opportunity to do this, but the first distinct memory I have of spending time with you was when you asked me to come in, watch your classes, um, uh, get an idea about how you do business and how you teach. Because at that time you had a really small group of people training in your garage. It was beautiful. As we said, it looks a lot like the, your new, incredibly beautiful dojo with the Tommy mats and uh, lots of equipment, but it was small. And I know you were thinking about growing then, 2004, 2005 ish. Um, I had already grown some schools a little bigger. So I came in, I spent some time, you know, studying your business practices, studying your teaching practices. Um, and one of the distinct memories, one of the most, besides the great teaching, um, all the different things that you bring to the table, one of the, one of the really great memories that has literally inspired me every day since I came up to Lansing and did that work with you was I sat in your house and you got your uh, collection of manila folders out. And in each folder, you had notes about a particular topic and you would go through and do that stuff. And then you would go to the next folder and do that stuff. And you've mentioned it many times. And honestly, I know a lot of people on this call work very, very hard. I have never seen anybody as diligent, as organized. Um, and somebody who, you know, it, it's, it's not because of me, although I like to think I had a tiny part of, in it, uh, took a, a very small martial arts school and has grown it into something that's just absolutely amazing. That's not an easy thing to do, as I think most of us can attest. And uh, it's just a tribute to Kent, your staying power in the arts, your passion for it. And uh, uh, just, I'm, I'm really glad you're here today. Oh, thank you. That's, uh, that's such a nice thing to say. I'm, I'm honored. And to be honest with you, um, I very much consider you part of the journey that, that got me here. You know, um, you know, it's funny because because the things I remember, I remember when you came to watch that class, like, I, I may have only had like two or three people maybe, maybe in, in that class. And, and, um, I re I, and I was telling you, I, I still have the actual uh, recommendations you gave me and the one that stuck out. The only one that I was able to do at that time period because of whatever, uh, you know, finances were to invest in school at the time is I distinctly remember you wrote in there, like you need to change the colors on your website. This is intimidating and not friendly <laughs> at all. And, and to me, I was just like, it is and because and I, I couldn't see it, i couldn't see it that way you know mm -hmm. and you you were kind of the first person to come along to really suggest to me you know try to look at this through the eyes of somebody who doesn't do this at all you, you see this through the eyes of someone who's been doing it their whole life so there's no way you can look at it properly you know, like like a like a like a parent and a child right if a parent expects a child to to approach something with all the knowledge of 40 years behind them but they're only eight years old, that parent's going to be disappointed in the reaction of that child, right? But if a parent can look at it and go, okay, this kid's only eight, how is he seeing the world and how can I help him understand it better? You get a, you get a much, much more positive result. And I really felt you helped do that for me in, in the beginning with something, something as simple as just website colors. 
um, was the beginning of me starting to say, hmm, you know, maybe I should stop looking at this like, why can't you do this? I can do this. Why can't you do this? You know, and that was that was a major breakthrough for me. And it really helped me solidify the concept behind that. Um, being a good martial arts instructor is not about showing people what you can do. It's about showing people what they can do. And if you can do that, well, then then you're actually improving somebody's life versus just, you know, showing off. There is a truth bomb already in the first five minutes of the call. <laughs> Ooh, and we are going to come back to that. Furiously <laughs> scribbling notes. Um, Sensei Dofan, I want to throw it over to you for, uh, for a little bit of a hello as well. Thanks. Yeah. So Ken, I know, uh, I think the first place I met you was in JMAC Gen 2. Uh, since the Sino had you and I both in to teach um, at separate times. And that was the first time I met you. And the last time I met you was at JMAC Gen 3. And we had just like this awesome conversation. Like I remember just yeah. having this like really good conversation with you. Um, I didn't know really a lot about you other than what Sensei Suino had said. And uh, so I went through um, your website. And one of the things that I was really, it was nice to see was that uh, all of your credentials, you put them way down at the bottom. Like you don't actually like, you know, splash all these ranks up. But uh, if you read through the names, there's no doubt about the credentials and the people that you've trained with, like um, uh, Daniel Lanero, uh, Tadashi, uh, Tadashi Yamashita, when you did Shuren Ru. Um, and of course, there's other names. I'm not going to name every single one, but the one name that obviously always stands out uh, is Dan Inosanto, right? And if... Uh, you know, probably Bruce Lee's top student ever. And you've trained with this guy for like more than a decade, like longer than a decade, which 20 is 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Two decades, not something that uh, I don't know anybody like that. But uh, one thing I want to say about what I'm excited about this conversation is oftentimes when we have people on, I know a lot about what they already know. Like I already, and I don't know a lot about what you know. So I'm excited to just <laughs> hear what you have to say about those things. Um, you know, often when I talk to people, um, we're not really talking. They're just waiting for their moment to interrupt and tell me everything that they know. And when you and I chatted, it was a true conversation. We actually really connected with each other. There was no crap about, you know, Filipino is better than Okinawan, is better than Japanese, is better than... It was just, hey, man, we put on uniforms and we get sweaty and we train, right? Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed that. So I know you're a super intelligent guy. One of the things that uh, really stood out to me is I know you're also just a student of the martial arts. Like you're just a student of whoever is there trying to take whatever you can get, make yourself better and use it to help your student uh, or students. Um, I know that you share freely because I've sat there and watched you teach. I know that you don't hold back. Like you give everything you have. You always give your best. Um, I, I honestly, like, I, I feel like after the short time that I've known you and I just think you're what martial arts needs right now. Like you're the type of guy, you're young. When people walk in the room, they want to see a guy like you. They want to see a young, strong, intelligent person who wants to share freely um, and wants to do it with the students, not just stand up in front of the room and tell everybody what to do. So that's, that's my introduction for you, Kent. And I'm really like, I'm really excited to talk to you. But before Sean takes it away, I, I want to mention a couple of things about Sensei Legacy, who's also on the call. Um, I, always, I always take this opportunity to try and drop a little history on people about Sensei Legacy. And, uh, you know, I always mention that he was a student of Harold Warden's, a uh, disciple of Benny Allen's, trained with Richard Kim for over a decade, and is currently a student of Anthony Sandoval, practicing uh, Way Crane, um, and totally, like, building his sensei up by promoting that like incredibly and pushing it out and pushing it out. Um, but last week when we were talking to Hanchi Burkowski, something kind of like hit my mind. Um, and that was that Hanchi Burkowski was a person who uh, helped to organize EMAF coming to Canada, him and, and Hanchi John Terrian. And had he not done that, even though he didn't know it, I, we would have never met Sensei Suino. Like that would have not happened. And what a lot of people don't know about Sensei Legacy that I know is that uh, when he was leaving 
uh, a previous lifestyle where he was in, uh, riding motorcycles, he had decided that he wanted to either A, learn to do music, or B, take up martial arts. And there was a dojo, Harold Warden's dojo was located near his home. So he went there and he walked down the stairs and when he opened the door, the class let out a big key eye. And never being in martial arts, he kind of got startled and he turned around and left. And then two days later, he came back. And the thing I, I like to throw out and I like to say about that is, what if he didn't? What if he didn't go back after he got startled and left? This wouldn't be happening right now. This call wouldn't be happening with these people. Uh, I wouldn't have my kids. I wouldn't know Sean Benson. I wouldn't be sitting in this dojo. I like all of these things that have happened over the last three plus decades for me would have not happened had he not turned around and went back in. So that's one of the things I want to say about Sense of Legacy. Uh, I like to drop this history out there. And one of the things that uh, for all of us on the call who are teachers, you never know when your action is going to be something that's going to be life changing for people. That's going to be, and the longer you've been in martial arts, like Sense of Legacy or Sense of Suino for, for five decades, you no longer even know how many lives you've changed or pushed or what directions because you're just doing what you do. Like you just come in and do what you do and you don't think about how it's affecting people. But that's what, uh, that's what I have to say tonight about Kent and about uh, Sense of Legacy. So take it away, Sean. Right on. I'm just going to take a moment, um, Guru, to talk to the audience a little Okay, is Sean the only one gone? <laughs> he warned us that he was going to be glitchy. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to right now say that uh, um, while we're waiting for Sean to come back, what he was going to say is um, this, this, uh, this interview is supposed to be about some people just sitting around talking about martial arts. If you have some questions, send them through to the chat. Uh, we have Victoria Feth who's on the call and she's going to push them through to us unless they're not good. Um, this is also, I guess we're going to say it's an 18 plus type of an event. So you might hear some words, people might say some things that uh, you don't like, but this is a free podcast. So if you don't like what you hear, you can feel free to tune out at, at any point um, on that note. So, uh, on that note, that's the disclaimer that we always put out there. And Kent, I guess, uh, while we're waiting for Sean to get back on and, and uh, said Susino to come back, uh, I'm gonna, I know what Sean's quite first question to you would be. Um, how do you feel when you hear that type of an introduction from uh, Sen Susino and myself? How does that make you feel? Or um, what are the uh, thoughts that come to mind while you're sitting there listening to that? It's humbling. That for sure. Um, you know, honestly grateful that I have an amazing person like him in my life and because he opened up doors for me to meet amazing people like you, you know, and uh, I, I actually really look forward to in person having the opportunity to meet uh, Sensei Legacy because I, I, you speak so highly of him and every time we've ever talked, his name always comes up and it's, it's always with this, um, this respect and this gratitude that comes along, you know, and obviously he's somebody that uh, that shaped your life in a very positive way. And, you know, I, I can't pass up an opportunity to meet an awesome soul like that, you know? Um, so I would say grateful, you know, I would say humble and, uh, a, a little bit like it's, is this real? <laughs> you know, is this, um, because, because for, for, for me, it doesn't feel that way for me. It just feels like I'm, just trying to figure this whole thing out still all the time. You know, I'm, I'm constantly uh, studying this art and that art. And, and, and um, you know, you had made a comment um, or when you guys made a comment about how like, you know, I, 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 I study with any, anybody I can, I just try to take whatever I can. And it's funny when you said that, one of my first thoughts was like, yeah, that probably used to be me. I probably, I probably used to try to take everything I can. And now I approach it very differently. Now when I study, you know, I don't look at it like, you know, absorb everything around me. Now I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 43 in November. And so I'm not, 
I'm not 20 anymore. I can't just, you know, go and do the backflips and I can't just do all that kind of stuff. I have to, I have to be cautious with my body if I want to continue to use it, you know? And so therefore I, I think more about like, not, can I take everything I can, but what can I use now? What, what can be, what can I absorb? And not just for myself, but, but maybe it'd be something like, Oh, like maybe personally, I don't really need this, but that teaching method, I know exactly who that's going to help. And so now I really get into teaching methods. I really dork out over good teachers. You know, <laughs> I really, I want to see like, Oh, how are we communicating the information? Because I'm a big believer that, you know, uh, like in our, in our school, uh, I'm a big fan of ranking, uh, like student ranking and instructor ranking are totally separate. I know uh, I've been part of organizations and part of uh, schools that, that a lot of them like, Oh, you get your first degree black belt and that automatically makes you a teacher, or you got to wait your fourth degree before you can be a, a sensei or whatever that might be. And I learned, I learned a long time ago, or I noticed a long time ago that the belt around somebody's waist and their ability to communicate their knowledge don't necessarily connect to one another. So to me, you know, an instructor program, uh, over the years, my instructor program has gone from, you know, oh, top level students, it can kind of help to no, we need to pull these people aside, we need to have classes on how to teach, how to communicate, how to connect, how not to alienate people, you know, like, like, again, going back to like, what I said about Nick teaching me how to how to see it through their eyes. Because the more you can understand it through their eyes, the more I think you're able to communicate and connect anyways. And once you can reach that connection with a student, and I think once they get to know you a little bit better too, the communication's easier. Because if you don't know a person, you might not understand their mannerisms. You might not understand the, the, the verbiage they use. But as you get to know somebody better and you start to understand how another person thinks in both directions for both the student and the teacher, I think it becomes a, a more productive synergistic relationship over time. I love that when you said about uh, the rank and the teaching are, are separate from each other. It's interesting you say that sense of legacy. I remember when uh, we were going to start training with Sensei Suino, he said, I didn't pick the highest ranking guy. I picked the best one That's, what, that's what, to teach us the idol. I remember him saying uh, that distinctly. Uh, so another question that uh, we always ask everybody, Kent, is, you know, how did you, what were your, we talked about Sense Legacy going down, opening the door, getting the key eye. What was that first open door for you? Who was there? Who was that teacher? How did you get there? Who were the people? How are you feeling? Do you remember what it was like when you went in? Uh, well, I was seven. <laughs> so my memories of it are limited, uh, but they're really good. Um, so I was seven years old and my, my parents asked me if I, you know, I wanted to uh, do this Taekwondo class. I had never heard of Taekwondo at the time. You know, I, I first got exposed to martial arts when I was five years old, watching Saturday morning Kung Fu theater, you know, and I remember that vividly. I remember the, the opening to Kung Fu theater, the yin yang would show up on the TV and start spinning real fast. And I, I remember that. I remember watching these, you know, high wire Chinese movie acts. And it's like these guys had superpowers. It was amazing to me. And <clears throat> pardon me. And uh, my parents, when I was seven, said, you know, do you want to try this martial arts class? And I thought it was karate. And they're like, oh, it's Taekwondo. It's probably the same thing. Because at that time, Taekwondo was not nearly as popular as it is today. And I remember uh, going in there and I didn't even have a, a uniform or anything like that. I, I was actually wearing a pair of uh, pajama sweatpants that my parents, you know, had bought me. They, they were pajamas. They said ninja on the side of the leg and all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I don't remember the instructor's name. I wish I could. But the one thing I, I that stands out to me the most is uh, I remember some things that he did. I remember some drills that we did. I remember movements. But what I remember most is my grandfather. My grandfather um, and I we didn't really get close into the last two years of his, of his life till, till like I was between 16 and 18. He passed when I, when I was 18. Um, but at seven years old, I had almost no connection with him as far as like getting to know him personally. And I remember him, uh, him having to take me cause he was the only one available to take me to, to my Taekwondo class. And I can vividly remember looking over to the sidelines and seeing my grandfather being the only person uh, watching sitting in a chair 
watching me out there. And that was just a special moment to me. I remember I wanted to do good for him. I wanted to, it was my opportunity to, you know, show my grandpa that like, I don't know, check me out. I'm a ninja. I don't know. You know, it was, it was something. It was something because I didn't really know him that well. So my earliest memories of martial arts, ironically, are not about the martial arts. They're about getting to know my grandfather. So it's a, it's kind of a little bit different story. That's awesome. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, by the way, just I said, I would have said this, but my internet is, is rad tea tonight. So I do apologize, but that's why we're all on the call. Um, and I just want to throw out to the audience that we have a chat button down below so that for your questions, you feather them through for uh, Tori, who's running the show behind the scenes, and then we'll get the questions and we'll be able to ask Guru Nelson. Um, so I want to ask you, because I was watching a lot of the stuff on you and I really enjoyed it. Um, so you started in Taekwondo, and I know that fundamentally, you very quickly thought of yourself as somebody who wanted to excel in the martial arts more so than Taekwondo. So how is it that you went from starting in something at a young age that was a relatively specific discipline and what made you think of the bigger picture? So uh, I, did, I did Taekwondo for however long that was. I, I don't remember because I was seven, but I remember when I was 12 years old, um, we went from whatever that Taekwondo school was. I don't remember if there was a break or not. I, it's really difficult for me to remember that far back, but, uh, at 12 years old, I went into, uh, another Taekwondo school. Uh, and the main teacher at the time, his name was Chad Ostrander. And if it wasn't for Chad Ostrander, I would not want to be a martial arts teacher today. Uh, I remember like Chad, if anytime I get an opportunity to sing Chad's praises, I always do because he started this, like everything you see here behind me. Everything you read on the internet, in my opinion, goes back to the belief that Chad Ostrander had in me because I had never experienced somebody who had that belief in me before. He is the reason why I wanted to be a martial arts teacher. The way he made me feel, I wanted to, I wanted to be able to do, I respected him so much. I wanted to be him and that's what he did. He made me feel amazing and had belief in me. So therefore that's what you do. You, you, you give people that belief, you know, and it makes their lives better. And so I started working on that, but that really wasn't about, uh, you know, specifically being Taekwondo. Probably at the time I was thinking that cause I was you know, 12, 14, something like that. And, uh, it wasn't until I got into karate, uh, when I was probably 14 years old, I, I, I we left that Taekwondo school for various reasons and we entered a, a karate school. And in that school, they offered four different uh, martial arts. They did uh, karate, they did kobudo, they did iaido and nihon and jujitsu. And so, so very much like Sensei Suino school, <laughs> when I think about it, um, very similar. Uh, and I would, my parents would drop me off there. And I would hang out in the, in the basement of the school while the little kids' classes were running. And as I was learning things, I'd go down the basement, I'd practice. I, I remember I had this notebook, and I started writing down, like, uh, well, how come, you know, like, we never did these punches when I was in Taekwondo. But, but at this karate school, we never do the spin kicks that, like, always work for me, you know. And, and, and I started recognizing that, like, oh, one style doesn't have it all. And so I started making this my own private catalog of things that worked for me. And then I started making, you know, and that turned into just everything I learned at one point. And eventually, I should say probably it was everything I learned at one point and then started whittling it down to things that worked for me. But at that time period, uh, that idea of mixing the martial arts was really frowned upon in that era. Um, so I kind of kept that to myself. And uh, it wasn't until, it wasn't until 1993, you know, it wasn't until the, until the UFC came along where it became, uh, oh, check out this, this, you know, the, the, the mixture of the arts. Actually, then it wasn't even a mixture. It was still individual arts. And it was like, what, three, four years later that they really started like blending the arts together. And the strikers started learning from the grapplers and the grapplers started learning from the strikers. And, and, and I was like, wait a minute this is awesome because this is what I've been like wanting to be able to do in the open for the longest time, you know, because my instructors would not allow me or would not look favorably upon me training in multiple things at that time. Um, so as far as wanting to be a teacher, 
hundred percent goes back to Chad Ostrander. Um, as far as me wanting to be a teacher of multiple arts, I don't know that I wanted to be a teacher of multiple arts as much as I just wanted to be able to connect and help people with the martial arts. And I don't think the style ever mattered to me. Mm. And, you know, when I was training at the, at the Japanese school that was called Anderson's Karate Dojo, by the way, um, it was run by a man named John Anderson, Sensei John Anderson. And when I was there, I was studying four different arts at once. They were just all separated, you know? So, so to me, I, I just loved doing whatever. So I didn't, it didn't matter to me if somebody was doing Kobudo, if they were doing karate, you know, if they wanted to learn some Taekwondo, something on the side, it didn't matter to me. I just wanted to connect with people and train. I just loved to train, you know, and, and that's what was most important to me. So I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it, it perfectly answers it. I really love that. And what Sensei Dolphin said, you know, when I was looking down the list and before the call for everybody who's watching, I asked how Guru wanted to be addressed. And he was worried that saying he was a ranked Sensei and a ranked Sifu uh, and Guru might sound a little, uh, you know, um, self-important. It's the exact opposite. These are legit. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, I wish I started when I was seven like you. W what was that? I, we talked about it and I, th I think, you, you touched on it, but what was that feeling? Like, what's that feeling you had as a kid that the teacher gave you? We all kind of know what it is, but what is it that you've got a seven-year-old in front of you that you want them to feel? What do you want them to have that's so important that you've dedicated your life to this? You know, I remember the moment, the exact moment. And at the time uh, we were standing in class I was a yellow belt in Taekwondo and anybody who's a yellow belt in Taekwondo knows that um, although no rank is insignificant, um, it's a lot easier to get your yellow belt than your black belt, <laughs> put it that way, right? Uh, but when you get that first rank, it's the hardest thing you've ever done because it's the first one you've ever earned, you know? And so I, I'm standing there with my yellow belt on and I remember um, Chad was walking uh, in front of us. And he was holding up his, the, his, the tail of his black belt to everybody. And he was saying, you know, do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? And making everybody say yes. And I'm, I'm getting ready to give him my best yes, you know. And, uh, and he walks up in front of me and I'm all prepared to like impress him with my yes. And he's, he looks at me, he goes, passes by, he goes, no, I know you want this. And then it keeps going to the rest of the kids. And I was like, oh, oh, what, what about, oh. And, and it was a strange feeling to me that like, he already knew. And I knew in that moment when he said that, when he already knew, if he had the confidence in me to be able to achieve that, he, he's already there. He's been through the process. He knows what it takes. He can recognize what it takes because he's seen it. I have not. But the fact that he had that belief in me meant he saw something in me. And if he saw it, then I could believe that I have it. It wasn't just in my head because an experienced person had that belief in me. So therefore I could fully buy into that belief in me. And, you know, to me, that's, that's the biggest thing, especially when I'm teaching kids um, is to, is to put that belief in themselves because that transfers far beyond martial arts. You know, if you can, if, if, a, if a kid believes, Hey, you know, my instructor believes in me, he says I can do this and he knows what he's doing. So I can probably do this, you know, but if you have an instructor that tells you, ah, oh, you can't do it, you're going to blow this. You probably are because that guy knows better. Right. So I think it's really important. You know, you uh, are, um, uh, Randy had mentioned that, you know, it, it's important with, uh, with teachers because we have the opportunity to change people's lives as a teacher. And I think that one of the things we have to recognize is that we have that opportunity to change people's lives for the better. Absolutely. We also have the opportunity to hurt and ruin people's lives if we're not careful. Uh, I had I mean, one of my paramedic instructors, his name was Tim Cooper. He's passed away now. He was an amazing teacher, amazing teacher. And, you know, Coop brought me into his office one time. We would all, we kind of had this strange relationship where after classes, I could just go into his office and we just sit and talk forever, you know? And, and he mentioned one time, he says, yeah, I got to go talk to so-and-so because I was a little sharp with him earlier today. And I didn't mean that. I says, well, what do you mean? He says, it says, you know, when you're in my position, you have the ability to build somebody up with a word or cut them down completely with a word or even just the tone of your voice. The word doesn't even matter. And it says you have to be so aware of that when people look up to you 
you know, when they're looking to you to learn something. And I've, I've always remembered that lesson, you know, and, and I can't say that I've always been a hundred percent at it because like anything else, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm human. I'm imperfect. I'm learning too. Every day I become a better teacher, which means if, which means I'm learning every day, right? If, if there was no more to learn, I just stop right where I'm at. Cause you know what they say, the old saying, uh, you know, the difference between genius and stupidity is that genius has limits. You know, I, I, always, <laughs> oh I, my God, I'm writing that I, down. Another truth bomb. That's brilliant. Wow. I, I, per, I always take that. To, I always make a joke with my students. So I take that to me. And I say, what does that mean to you? And they go, Oh, it means when you, you think you know everything, you can't learn anymore. And I say, yes, it does mean that. But also remember that it means stupidity is limitless. <laughs> so be careful yeah. of that. You know, uh, but, but I, think, I think that's really important is that you have to, you have to remember that, that your, your indifference can also cut somebody down because they're, they're coming to you to become a better person, right? That's a responsibility, 100%. And that's why, to me, a student rank and an instructor, or a student rank and an instructor rank should be separate because they're different missions. So I want to say one thing quickly, and then I actually want to ask everybody on the call the same question. Um, first off, Hanshi Legacy, you won't remember this, but when you gave me my green belt, you just simply said when you handed me, if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll be a black belt one day. And I went from wanting to be a black belt to knowing I would be a black belt. And uh, everything had to happen. But I, I hear you because that confidence that that one compliment gave me was like, not, do, not only do I belong here, but I'm at least good enough to stay here like another while longer. My question for you, and I'd love to hear every sensei's opinion on the call. There's the old school idea of the martial arts that literally goes back to, you know, kneeling in the snow for a month outside the Shaolin temple to prove that you want in. The teacher doesn't come find you. But I really love what you're talking about, that you meet the student at their level or else it's going to be really hard to bring them along. So I want to ask what that balance is, because there really is something amazing about a teacher coming down and, and, and respecting me as a white belt, but also me being maybe a little old school scared or a little old school wanting to impress my teacher. I think that can be a motivator, too. Where do you all sit on that? Who wants to start? I want to hear what, what uh, Legacy Sensei has to say about that. Because he is our, he, he's the senior on this call. He's got the most experience, and I got to imagine he's got a great, up, uh, a great insight on this. Well, the thing about that is, I think that we're still yellow belts and we're still green belts. We, we've achieved those ranks, but those things are still in us. And we feel what it's like, or we felt what it was like. And sometimes you, you need encouragement, you know, and it's, uh, and somebody who thinks they know everything doesn't really know anything, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I can be a yellow belt anytime. I don't have a problem with that. I think my teaching, uh, uh, if you allow yourself to go there and on the same level as your student, because we are servants, right? We're there to serve the people who come in. And if, you know, they have problems, that doesn't uh, relieve us of our duty. We have to try to make them as best as they can be, regardless yeah. of what their limits are. So I, I, I like that. I like being sometimes a yellow belt and a green belt and working on their level. Thanks, Hanchi. Sensei Suino? I was going to address the level of um, hardship you impose on students. Um, as I've said before, you know, the legacy group uh, trains very hard. And I've known Hanchi for decades, and he's not afraid to say the hard things, as well as the, as well as the, the encouraging things. Um, I think he, he says them with sincerity and care, and that makes it, that makes it more tolerable. Um, there's a local guy here in Ann Arbor, Keith Hafner, who runs a Taekwondo school. Um, and he says, um, there's two kinds of parents, right? The one who dislikes everything their child does and the one who likes everything their child does. Both are destined for failure. I don't know where the balance is, but there's gotta be some hardship, right? There's gotta be some discipline. Um, uh, yes. It's not wrong to say, hey, what you're doing is, isn't right, it needs work. Um, but as you mentioned, Kent, it's important to do so uh, with compassion and care 
and uh, consider the effects of your words. Sensei Dopa? It's hard to answer that question quickly because that's a topic that we could probably talk about for an hour and a half, just, just that, that simple question. Um, you know, uh, building on what Sensei Suino said, I think if you make a connection with somebody and you can build trust with them as soon as possible, a connection and trust, which is something Sensei Legacy did initially with me. I remember that. He built connection and trust with me, tried to build some personal bridges. And then uh, when that trust is there and that respect, you're giving that respect and the teacher makes a comment, you have a drive to want to meet that need or that expectation of that teacher. But, you know, you've heard me say this before in class, Sean, and this is something that Sensei Legacy once said that very much impacted me, which is, Every student who walks in here, I often think this could be the best martial artist the world has ever seen, this person. Every single one who walks in the door, I think that. Everyone, when they come in, I think, I got to give my best to this student. I got to help them. They could be the best one ever. They could be the next Funakoshi. They could be the next Bruce Lee. They could be the next... I don't want to be the person who stomps that down. I want to be the person that opens those doors for that, the world to get that. And as a teacher, that's, that's one of my uh, primary responsibilities. And I think that of every student who comes here. Um, and of course, as they train, you figure out, <laughs> um, maybe not, yeah. right? <laughs> that one's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that. Some people come in and at first you, if you judge them initially, when they walk in, you look at them and you think, Oh, like this person's this, this person's that they'll surprise you. Um, you know, it's another thing that since legacy said to me is I value these. Hey Randy, it's the ones, the odds against making it, they're going to be the best ones. The ones where you look at them and you think, Hey, the odds are all stacked up against this person that they'll ever make it. When they do, they're going to be the best one. And if you can play a hand in that, that's a life well lived. That's awesome. Thanks, Sensei Dofa. And thanks. You. So, so uh, Guru Nelson, I want to put it back to you, but I want to include uh, Justin Shea's <clears throat> questions, which are in this ballpark, and it seems a good time to throw them at you, uh, which is, we've talked about it a bit, but what are the best ways to inspire the students? We want to do that, but what are they? And also, what have you learned from teaching teachers as opposed to students? How did that change your, your approach perspective? Mm. All right. Well, you may have to remind me of part of that question again. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Cause I, I do tend, I do tend to go off on tangents. I'm told. So, um, well, the first thing I, I think, uh, I think back to a moment ago, what, what Nick, what Sensei Suino was saying there about uh, with like the parents, right? The, hate everything or love everything and both are destined for failure. I, I think he's right on the money with that. One of the things that I'm, I try to do, especially with our kids' classes, but I do this with our adults too, but, but very much so with the kids, especially the little ninjas, the little guys, is I'm big on consistent consequences. And what I mean by that is both the positive and the negative. Uh, and who taught me that was one of my little students, to be honest with you. Um, you know, if a, if, a, if a child does something wrong, it, it's funny. Like, so I, I make a joke about how I go into the into drill instructor mode or, or sometimes my students call me like, you know, oh, it's, you know, Sergeant Slaughter's here. If, uh, if I come in, we, we, somehow we, we got to a point where, you know, the kids' classes, you should just be like, they were going crazy and I have to be like, line up to start class and they'd line up. And at a certain point, we would notice that, I'd walk, I'd walk into school and they'd all be running around doing their thing, going crazy before class. We let them play games and different stuff. And I, I, all I have to do is just pick one belt up off the floor. We make like a ring of belts they can play inside of. And I pick one belt up and those kids stop. They pick the belt up, they line themselves up. And I discovered through that, like, oh, well, that's because consistently whenever I pick that belt up, they know class is going to start. I says, all right. And so I, you know, this is, kind of years ago, but, but now I'm, I look at it like, well, uh, if, it, if it, I'm going to give them one warning and they know one warning is all they get. And that's everybody gets the one. And then after that, they get the consequence. But at the same time, when they do good, 
I always give them a good consequence. They get the high five, they get the good job, they get that. That's awesome. Let's have you demonstrate that in front of the class. So they know one way or another, they're going to get my attention. So right. they get to make the decision if that attention is negative or positive, but they're going to get it. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I let them, I let them have that choice and that, that creates more of an autonomy for that student, right? And it be, becomes more of a personal experience for them rather than, you know, just being dragged to a class where some guy orders them around and then mom, you know, throws them back in the car and they go grab McDonald's and go home, you know, uh -huh. whatever it might be. So I try to be, but it lets them know there's choice. And I try to tell them that, listen, this is a microcosm of the world out there. You're, it's not always going to be easy. There's going to be things you have to do. Sometimes it will be fun. Sometimes it will be hard. You're going to achieve things and you are definitely going to experience disappointment too. It's just what comes along with it. And you're going to have to interact with people you don't know. And you're going to have to interact with people you love and people you hate. And, and that's the beauty of martial arts. And when we talk about how martial arts is more than just, you know, punching and kicking and choking, but it's the, it's, you know, those skills transfer outside of the school beyond self-defense. And that's really what it does is that that's, it's a microcosm for, for all the, the, the skills they'll need in their head to deal with life out there. So to me, you know, having that positive, negative, consistent consequence is the, is the most important thing because Sensei Suino is right on the money. You know, if you hate everything your child does, then why would they ever want to do anything? You know, because you're just going to hate it. And if you love everything your child does, well, then why would they ever try to do better at anything? Because it doesn't matter. They can do the bare minimum and that parent's going to just love it. So, Hey, you know, the other thing that I will say this, one of the things that got me into making sure that I give that positive negative consequence, it was nothing more heartbreaking to me about teaching kids when I first started than I would see a kid work really hard, do some demonstration in front of the class and immediately look over, you know, to the viewing area to see if mom or dad saw and they're just all on their cell phone, you know, they're playing on their tablet or whatever. All that kid wants to do is he just wants to be recognized. Look, I'm working hard and I wanted the person I love most to see that. And they're on their phone. And whether or not it's an important work email, it doesn't matter what it is. That child doesn't understand that. That child doesn't know that. And so therefore, you know, I kind of took it upon myself to make sure that I gave him the high five. I gave him the pat on the back. I gave him the job well done. And that was sort of the beginning of me recognizing the value in positive consequences. So I, I really love that. And, you know, I grew up in the eighties. I think we're about the same age. I, I might be a year and a half older than you. Um, but my parents without any sense of not paying attention to me, just didn't come to my stuff. It wasn't a thing. And right. so I loved that. Like my ballet teacher got to be part of the village that raised me. And oh, when you I did ballet too, I did. You did ballet. I did ballet. Oh my <laughs> God, I love this. Did, I mean, they, that got me into karate because by the time I got to university, I was performing and I wanted something similar that was classical and Hanshi Legacy fit that bill for me. And he was the first person other than my ballet teacher who didn't care who I thought I was. He said, line up and do the art. It's been- Yeah, it's funny because Tensei Legacy oh. always reminded me of a ballet teacher too. <laughs> don't let him pick on your tights gary don't let him do that <laughs> hey listen um uh, a buddy of mine that i went to college with signed up for a ballet class and after about two months every single day i was teasing him about his tutu or whatever you know whatever it was that guy had more dates you know uh Right. I mean, he was the only dude in a class of 50 women doing ballet and um, it made the rest of us pretty jealous. Well, you made it, you clarified it for me because you said women. Yeah. Fair point. Well, <laughs> Not that just, there's anything wrong. Like I don't, I have no problem with anything else, but that's he had lots you, of uh, dates with yeah. girls. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. But, you know, I, you, you mentioned, you mentioned that, uh, you know, ballet got you into karate. It was the other way for me. Karate got me into ballet. Oh yeah, go, let's talk about that a little. Oh, uh, so when I was uh, probably 15, uh, 15 or 16, somewhere around there, uh, the Anderson's Karate uh, Dojo was actually located like kitty corner from a dance studio. 
and there was a summer where he had struck up like a some sort of a deal with the with the dance teacher where we could go over and do ballet like before we came over and did the the karate classes and i remember um sensei anderson specifically saying you're gonna go do this because it is going to make your legs and your kicks incredibly strong and i remember the first time i had to do a plie and i was amazed at like wow i do all these katas and all these kicks and i am super weak <laughs> I do it. you know and and it didn't it didn't take long before i had a couple of, of revelations right one revelation was that like yes oh my gosh this is totally gonna help me you know second was that like oh things outside of just martial arts can help my martial arts right mm -hmm. and then probably the third and biggest one was i don't want to do ballet this is hard and, yeah. and i knew like <laughs> I'm gonna go with martial arts. Dancing is not my thing, you know, but, but I'm so appreciative of that opportunity because it, it made me appreciate ballet. And now my, uh, both my niece and nephew uh, are with uh, American Ballet Theater in LA. And my nephew is actually the, uh, the lead role in the Nutcracker for, uh, for ABT. So, and I got to watch them do a little ballet too one day and they train hard. Those kids oh. take hard falls on wood floors and they get up crying and just get back in line and do it again. It's interesting that, that you mentioned American Ballet Theater. Normally Lee Thompson would be, this is turning into the ballet podcast, which is great um, because my girls and my son all did ballet uh, at a very high level. And um, yeah, Lee Thompson, uh, who's a black belt in Legacy Shore, danced with American Ballet Theater when Barishnikov and Nureyev were there. Um, really yeah and he's he's normally is on this call like normally he's watching so he'd be happy to hear about your uh, niece and nephew with american ballet theater so um well, if you've two... never seen if you've never seen barishnikov dance you should go youtube that man and see what he can do oh uh, since my like god right me on to him too. <laughs> absolutely oh. um um, I've read the biograph biographies of both Nureyev and Barishnikov, and then I saw Barishnikov dance, um, both in terms of, you know, ballet, and then in, uh, uh, what was the movie? Was it called White Knights? Um, yep. yep. Uh, Gregory, Hines. Gregory Hines. Yeah. There's an opening scene with him dancing in there, and when you see that, if you got a martial artist mind, you just go, if I could move, like, what I would give to be able to move like that guy, right? Gregory Hines or Barishnikov? <laughs> Hey man, either one. Although I'm not yeah. a big fan of tap dancing, but you know, yeah. hey. I love to. Quick question or, or, or comment about that, uh, Guru. I was uh, in high school. I started when I was nine, and then when I was like 16, um, I was playing basketball in the gym one day, and I was like, I think I'm going to try and dunk. And I'm 5'10, and this guy goes, Hey everybody, Benson thinks he's going to fucking dunk. Why don't you try something more realistic, like climbing Everest? So I just, I'd never dunked before. I laid the ball down, and I fully clean dunk, and uh, that's all ballet. And literally afterwards, like guys would walk by me in the hall and just be like, yeah, ha, ha, ha. hey man, uh, what's to do with this uh, fucking ballet thing you're doing? Can you tell me a little more about this? Anyways, yeah, fucking ballet is gay. <laughs> Seriously, like they had to like slip me notes, but I'm not exaggerating that my stock turned around and people went, oh, this is a valid thing. Um, in any case, uh, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about that. And I just, I'm, I do a ballet show for Netflix and these dancers will dance an eight hour day of ballet then shoot like a 12 hour day with dance scenes. They don't even think twice about it. Like we should all be training as hard as these dancers, man. It's fucking nuts. Wow. Um, so I wanna get back to you and I wanna get back to your path as you moved through different arts, different senseis. And, and, and I know we all wanna hear about your, your arrival with uh, you know, Guru Inosanto and, and what that Ji Kune Do experience was in relation to you know, the other stand up arts you were already doing. Well, it's, it's still an experience. I'm still working on it, you know, and uh, especially now <laughs> I'm, I've been toiling. I've been putting in like eight, 10 hour days working on a uh, uh, social distance curriculum, you know, thinking about in terms of, you know, what if, what if this lasts, you know, not in the beginning, this was two weeks, right? This, 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 this quarantine. And then it was two more. And it was two more. And now we're five months in. And so there's every reason to believe that, you know, we need to be prepared that this could be longer or we might go back to partner work and then have to go back to solo work and we vacillate back and forth. And I want to be prepared for that for my students. My, my students deserve to have an instructor that's prepared for that. 
You know, I, I, uh, more so than just, Hey, let's just shadow our emotions in the air. You know, it becomes, all right, let's, let's take this opportunity to focus on things we normally wouldn't be able to from several different arts to build our body. You know, uh, probably the beginning of Jeet Kune Do for me, honestly, was starting that list in, uh, in the basement of that karate school, you know, and then, and then getting exposed to the ballet, you know, getting exposed to something that wasn't specifically martial arts, but was specifically, and I wasn't doing it to be a ballet, you know, teacher or a ballet student either. I was doing it to improve me, mm. right? And that's really what Jeet Kune Do is. It's, it's, making the, it's making the arts serve the person, not the person serve the arts. Uh, and there's, there's nothing wrong, by the way, in either direction. It's really interesting to me sometimes when I see, um, you know, I'll see uh, uh, karate people or not even karate, to be honest with you, like uh, purists, let's say, or traditional martial artists, TMA, traditional martial artists. Uh, they like to, to sometimes put down Jeet Kune Do, uh, because like, oh yeah, it's a bunch of everything, but nothing really, you know, or, or jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. And I constantly hear, you know, Jeet Kune Do people that they'll, they'll bash purists of other systems. Yeah. All they can do is this karate or all he can do is a judo or all he can do is this or that. But then the JKD people go to those people to learn, to make their skills better. You know, so, so to me, it's a, it, it's, it's a relationship, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it, it's a yin and yang. It's a balance. It's a coexistence. And you have to have that. I don't think J, the JKD community could exist as well as it does without structured uh, traditional martial arts already, you know, something as a library, something for us to reference, something for us to fill our brains with. We need that. And at the same time, you know, uh, at the same time, I, I think traditional martial artists, I think they need guys that are mixing and blending systems because it also lends uh, credibility to their systems. You know, if you are, if the only thing you've ever done is grappling, right? Well, then uh, that's great. And I'm a grappler, you know, but if somebody who's a high level martial artist comes to you to learn grappling, well, then that gives even more credit to the art of grappling, right? Because they already have skills in other areas. They already have skills they can use to defend themselves, and yet they still want what you have, whether it's grappling or karate or Wing Chun or whatever it might be. So I, I, I just don't think that either one would be as strong without the other. That's all there is to that. You mm -hmm. know, but they got to, they're synergistic. So who do you, oh, yeah, Sensei Dofan. It's just a thought, Kent, that I, I want to share and hear your opinion on is, uh, you know, in my system, uh, we adhere to Matsumura, which you're a Shorin practitioner in the past. Um, mm -hmm. But I've often thought about what you're talking about. And Matsumura couldn't have been a traditionalist to Shorin Ru because it didn't exist. He created it. He had to go out and get these different things and bring it in to create the system. But a lot of times I think their tradition and the adherence is actually to your teacher and their way and yeah. their system, yeah. right? And what they're showing you and not throwing that out always for the, and I, so, so on that note, I would say maybe you are equally a traditionalist as far as, because you adhere to your teacher's systems, the, the people who show you. I, I, I love traditional martial arts. You know, so, so I'll give you a good example or not a good example anecdote, whatever. This morning before my workout, I came into the school and I, uh, <laughs> I don't tell a lot of you this, um, but I'll tell everybody now on a Zoom podcast, apparently. Um, <laughs> we can I edit it out unless you're watching live. You get it. Nope. I, I straight up this morning to get myself in the mindset to put some work in because I was not feeling it this morning. I came in here. I put on, I grabbed an old black Juka karate gi. And I wrapped that thing around me and I grabbed my old shredded black belt and I put that on and I went through pas eyes and I went, I went through pin-ons and I went through my katas because that always put me like in a mindset to get some work done. You know, that put me in a, in a focused mindset. Once that put me in that place, you know, then it was a gi top off and go grab the kettlebells because I was, it helped me get to that place where it's like, okay, I got a job to do. I need to get in a place where that's all I'm thinking about. And karate kata you know, if we, if we remove the element for a minute about like it's functional or non-functional applications or whatever, that's a whole different thing. 
But if we look at it for the simple fact of what other benefits you get from it, um, I, I, as I get older, I get, I, I think more about like, you know, the long stances actually make more sense than the short stances because that keeps your legs healthy, you know? So, I mean, I'm never going to use a, a, a short cat stance in a street fight. So therefore, if I'm doing my karate for me, I can change it to the more Japanese style long back stance because that's deeper and it's better for my hips, you know, or, or, you know, same with like a lot of the Okinawans have like more of a shorter walking stance. So I've kind of adapted more of a more Japanese longer stance because it's better for my hamstrings and better for my hips and better for my quads. Uh, I've gone back to playing with Bokata since this has all started. Well, number one, I got more space now to do it. But, you know, just, just being able to pick up the bow and swing it around and drop into the long stances and the bow is good for your shoulders because it keeps all the joint mobility going. You know, I, I think all of that is extraordinarily important. Uh, I don't go advertising to everybody that I'm still doing karate katas because I don't want people to think I'm, you know, like just a karate guy. But it's, it is still part of what I do. It's still part of who I am personally, whether it's in my curriculum or not. And that will always go in and out over the years. It's still part of who I am. And so therefore, there's no way you, say, you can say karate is not part of JKD because it is part of my JKD. It's part of, you know, what it helps me be, be a better me. I don't do it so I can preserve karate. I do karate to help preserve me. So I really hear that. Sensei Dofen, that reminds me of something you always say, which is like, just know why you're doing your kata, like what you're working on. Like, um, I really like that. Um, so question for you, as I'm getting to know you, uh, I mean, I can look at your website, but so you say, you know, lest people think I'm too much of a karate guy or this or that. Now I know the banner's martial arts, but what would you describe yourself as? Like, is it a JKD guy? Is it a grappling guy, an MMA guy? H how do you categorize that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough said. I I know that's such a bad answer too, but you know, like, uh, it depends on the, I, I wouldn't want to give up my jujitsu. I just spoke to my jujitsu teacher last night. We were chit chatting on the phone. I wouldn't want to give up. My, and by the way, if you don't know, his name is Chet Skemohar and he's out of uh, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu Fort Wayne. And he is an amazing jujitsu teacher. If you are in the Fort Wayne, Indiana area, you, you got to look him up. Um, but, uh, you know, I was working the wooden dummy today, as well as my Kobido and Karate Katas, you know, uh, uh, the other, you know, Friday, I got together with one of my students on a private basis, and we rolled for an hour, you know, like, uh, I, yesterday, I was doing um, uh, some kickboxing lessons over Zoom with Guru Daniel Lanero. like, I do it all because it's all part of me. And, and so I look at it, like, to me, it's part of the whole body, right? I look at it like, okay, well, jujitsu is this arm and, uh, you know, Wing Chun is this arm and Kali is this leg. And so you have to look at it like and say, well, how do you classify yourself? Well, I don't classify myself as a left arm. I don't classify myself as a right leg. I classify myself as a human being. I am a sum total of the parts. And so therefore, you know, KSK martial arts made the most sense to me because it's just martial arts. I really love that. So do you have a head instructor you'd call your, your guy or is it, is it a number of people? I, I would say it's an, it's probably a number of people. Um, as far as like, I'm, I'm, you know, my, my, my biggest influence, uh, you know, I've obviously is screw Dan. I've been with him for 20 years. Um, but as far as like, I rank people into my own ranking system. Uh, I don't, I don't really, uh, like push them to, to get into his program. If they want to, that's up to them. I'll help them most definitely, but I don't, I don't push that. My curriculum is my curriculum. And from the beginning, you know, guru has always told me uh, like, you can't get a copy of guru's curriculum. It doesn't work. Right. It doesn't happen. Right. You go train with him. He's like, well, write down what you can and write down in the order I'm doing it and figure it out on your own. Cause you're not going to remember it all anyways. And neither will I. It's like, Oh, okay. So he doesn't, he doesn't tell you, he doesn't give you a curriculum. He expects all of his instructors to write their own curriculums. Now, when it comes to jujitsu, I'm definitely under uh, uh, Chet Skemohart. 100% mm -hmm. I'm under Professor Chet. And I actually, like, I defer to him for the ranking because I'm not a black belt in Brazilian right. jiu-jitsu. I'm a two-stripe purple at this time right now. And so, therefore, you know, I feel that it would be, it would be disingenuous of me to, to be ranking people through to a to, – it would be disingenuous of me to rank yeah. people up to purple – in my, in my opinion, I've only been doing the jujitsu 10 years, um, you know, consistently anyways. Uh, but 
I don't know. I feel like I feel like I can serve my students better by putting them in front of him and watching the criteria that he uses to rank them because that helps me understand what it's like to be a teacher. It helps me understand the criteria I should be using. If I if I was a blue belt given blue belts or a purple belt given purple belts, then I would judge them against me personally instead of judging them against like years and years and years of seeing many people express the art. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? It makes a ton of sense. Uh, we're actually sort of cousins through uh, that because uh, I have a club in Toronto, but when I go to LA, for example, last year for half the year, uh, Jean-Jacques Machado is my jiu-jitsu coach and he goes to <gasps> Guru Inosanto for his striking work. I see. I, every time I go out to, uh, to the instructor camp uh, in LA for, for Guru Dan, I always take the, uh, the Jean-Jacques Machado workshop as well. Oh, great. And, uh, oh, I, you know, I, I, get, I get four days with, with, with Jean-Jacques a year, and I, I love him. I absolutely yeah. love him. He, I met him before I met the Gracies, and uh, he, his philosophy, I mean, you can tell that he's around there a lot. His, he's such a kind person, you know, and, and what's interesting to me is, like, a lot of times when you roll with guys that are more competition jiu-jitsu, I'm not a competition jiu-jitsu guy, but when you roll with guys that are competition jiu-jitsu, uh, they can they can tend to be a little rougher, a little faster, a little harder, you know, because they're, they're they they roll around goals and time limits and rule sets mm -hmm. and points, and that's cool. Uh, and I I sort of expected that maybe when I when I rolled with him, and yeah. he was just he was so gentle and amazing and friggin' deadly. Uh, it, you know, my I, I got a great I got a great G Jacques Machado story for you at the academy actually. Um, the first time I ever rolled with him, uh, well, the first time I had the opportunity to roll with him, he's like, okay, come on, let's, let's roll together, you know? And I thought, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I totally kept chickening out. A hundred percent kept chickening out. And, um, you know, everybody kept going in front of me. I was like, oh no, well, I'll take the next one. I'll take the next one until he was done rolling. And I was like, oh, shoot. And I was so disappointed uh, with myself. I thought about that every day for a year. And so, so I, went, I went back, and I was still a white belt in jiu-jitsu at the time, I think. And, uh, and I, he said, uh, okay, let's, all, let's roll. Who wants to roll? And I was like, I didn't want to chicken out. So I said, me, threw my hand up. And I, we were all in a big circle. Yo, and I, I said, cool, we're all going to start rolling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in there first before anybody else grabs them. You know, I get right up there. We bow. You know, we, we, we hit hands and, and we start rolling. And I'm thinking to myself, who cares, right? I mean, everybody in here is rolling. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm just happy that I, I conquered my fear. And it, it, he was so gentle, you know, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. And I actually thought I was doing good for a moment. <laughs> and then I noticed that I was dreaming. I was fully asleep. <laughs> I, there was a there was a hand that made its way in my collar and I was like, Oh, is that a, and I was done. And I was just, it was, it was like a split second, you know? And I kind of, oh, and I, I woke it up and I, I tapped him and I, and I looked around and everybody's looking at me and I had, I didn't realize that because I was so in my mind ready to get in and get the roll in. I realized we we're rolling with him one at a time. Everybody was watching him kick my butt. Right. I, in my mind, we were all rolling. But it was everybody yeah. just watching <laughs> us, you know, which was the scenario I wanted to avoid to start with. Um, but I love that. Yeah, so we're, we're cousins that way. I love it. Um, Hanshin Legacy, I want to ask you a question, be, and, and maybe we can go around the horn a bit too, uh, quickly or, or take your time. But, you know, going back to the idea of traditional versus something like a JKD, because when I think about you, I would think of you 100% as a traditional martial artist. But you're so excited every week when people say Bruce Lee is the most influential artist of all time. And, and, and I know you feel that way. How do you blend those two for yourself? The idea of being a traditional martial artist, but taking in everything we're learning as each year passes. I guess it's personal choice. Um, uh, I'm a traditionalist because I, I follow the way and, and I have to have a teacher. Uh, so there are experiences that are laid out and, and I like to follow those. I don't like to go up. Maybe it's because I lack the ability to be able to do the others, but I need a path. I need a sensei. And um, 
and I don't want to, I find, I would find it to be harder to become a master of something if you're doing a lot of different things. It's hard enough to become the master of one. So I have, maybe it's just uh, myself. You know, other people are probably much more intelligent than I. That's probably why I just stuck to uh, one style. But I like it that way. I, I just like to have a sword, but just keep sharpening it as opposed to trying different weapons. Thanks, Anchi. And That's my is... take on that. Uh, but uh, I don't, nothing is not right. I mean, nothing right. is wrong. Right. It's just your way of looking at martial arts. And what about you, Sensei Suino? I mean, you're a traditionalist who's a multidisciplinarian and, and you love the Bruce Lee. What, where do you, what do you think about all that? Uh, I think that it's really important. Uh, what Hanji just said, I, I, I believe 100% in that. I think you, uh, for, for me, all the martial arts I study uh, with great seriousness, uh, I have an instructor uh, and a lineage. Uh, it's not to say I don't blend them sometimes, but um, that's just a value to me. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that everybody has to have that. Um, uh, but I study several of them. And that's just because I have this insane brain that can't focus on one thing for any great length of time. Um, but, you know, you've seen the way I paint the, paint the picture. It's yeah. uh, the picture I paint is all uh, lineage based traditional Japanese martial arts. Mm -hmm. Um, before I ask Sensei Dolphin the same question, for everybody watching, this really is the gift I get as the host because I'm literally sort of figuring out how to answer my white belt who keeps asking me these types of questions, you know, uh, and I'm getting to ask like you guys and hear your answer. Sensei Dolphin? I'm a traditionalist. I, I'm supremely proud to be... Um, Adept in Shorin Ryu at a high level and uh, Mukso Jigden Nishin Ryu Yairo, like, and I, I follow the way of Sensei Suino and Sensei Legacy always, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of that. Um, now, this might be me rationalizing things, but I don't ever categorize martial arts in that way of traditional or practical. I think they're all practical, and I think they I all can be traditional, right? Uh, I like to look at things as systems or styles, right? And I think Shorin Ru is both a system and a style. And a lot of martial arts styles are no longer functional because they're a slave to a style, to a look. And I think the function needs to dictate the look, not the look dictate the function, right? And that's what I really love about Shorin Ru is that it's a, it's a, it's a system and a style that can take you a lot uh, across a lot of different um, ranges of combat from the outside to the in, like from the outside, from the striking till you come to the inside where you're doing some, some grappling and some clinching to taking the person down and trying to finish it there. I don't say that Sean Ru would teach you to be on the ground and doing things there, but I think it develops your mind in a way that if you found yourself there against somebody who's not, a BJJ black belt or a, I feel pretty confident that if an average person takes me to the ground, this might be a bold statement that I'm going to get up pretty quick or they're not going to be happy that they took me to the ground. Right. And sure. And is the thing that prepared me to do that because yeah. it is both a system and a style, not just a style. Thanks. That's uh, Guru Nelson. I see you nodding along at some points there. I feel like something really landed for you there. Well, I, I, I definitely enjoyed the, the comment about how, you know, the, the style should, should look like, uh, how, oh, how do you say it? <laughs> like a, the system should, like a, the stylization, the look should be a result of the training methods, not the training methods trying to emulate a look or, you know, a, a uh -huh. stylist performance. Um, I think that's natural, uh, especially when, especially amongst when you, you, you have like non competition based systems, right? So you have one person that's learned it a particular way and they teach it to somebody else who wants to learn, but maybe they have no interest in fighting. Right. So they're going to, 
miss out on certain things and they're going to work on emulating the look of their teacher more so than their own development because of some sort of pressure situation. Uh, and that's not good or bad. That's just what happens. I mean, my students aren't fighters. Like we're not, we're not, we're not trying to get in the ring and fight. Uh, it's all about self-defense. It's all about going home and surviving. And so therefore, and also all about, all about improving the self. And so therefore the look is different. Right. But I think with traditional martial arts, you know, part of, part of that is like, oh, okay, he does it this way and he's better than me. So I'm going to try to make it look exactly like he does it. And, and you kind of pass on that, that stylistic performance as time goes by, because if I can do it and look like my teacher, then that must mean I'm doing pretty good because I look just like him and he's better than me or she's better than me. And I think that's a natural human thing that we do. Uh, I, I, I think the closest thing we have to ju the closest thing we have to JKD and more of a traditional form martial art to me, honestly, is, is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Because in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you have two things. Number one, you have a set of fundamentals right in the beginning that you have to understand, right? You have to understand the positions, you have to understand transitions, you have to understand kind of the basic five or six submissions along with the, you know, the basic five or six escapes and sweeps, right? Once you have that foundation down, which you pretty much learn from white to blue, then through your blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, you're developing your own game. And through every role, through every pressure testing, you know, you get creative, you fail, you succeed. You know, you have moments of, of great accomplishments. You have moments of just heartbreaking failure. You know, you push yourself hard, you, but you develop, you know, you're not, you're not developing, uh, you know, jujitsu, like making people be just like you, you know, you're, you're really developing your own game and you're understanding more of the concepts and the principles behind the movement. And therefore you can teach somebody the art of jujitsu because those concepts and principles and movements are there. But it's really hard to teach them your particular style because your growth mm. is going in your own direction. You know, I can show you exactly how I do something, but unless you've rolled against the same people I rolled against at the same time, at the same period of time in history, we're not going to have the same experiences. So, so therefore, to me, when I see jujitsu organically grow like it does, that's very JKD philosophy to me. And I think it's one of the reasons why I love it so much. You know, same with the Filipino martial arts is that, you know, they... They, they're all grabbing each other's stuff and blending and stealing this and borrowing that and mixing it together. And that's, that's very JKD philosophy. Um, and so, uh, you know, where a lot of arts like, no, it has to be exactly this way, you know, or the hand, not this way. It has to be a quarter turn that way to be our style. And that's fine for people that want to do that. I, you know, I've, I've been part of that. And I've been that teacher, by the way, over the years that has said, no, 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 not this way, that way. You know, that's because it's what my teacher says. But ultimately, it comes down to what are the results you're getting? You know, if you take all the, all the stand-up away and you do just grappling, that's, you know, that jujitsu is, is the JKD. And I, 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 when I look at people that call themselves JKD people today, uh, JKD philosophy or JKD concept people, um, if they're not incorporating some sort of jujitsu into their game, you know, then I think they're, they're doing themselves a disservice and people that say, well, there's no grappling in, in, uh, in Jeet Kune Do. No, there's no grappling in your Jeet Kune Do. That's, that's how that goes, right? There's no grappling in your Jeet Kune Do. You've chosen to shut that off. Yeah. So I, I love rolling with, with, with jujitsu people because to me, they're, they're JKD people on the ground and they're, they're helping me make my JKD even better. I love it. I think it's great. Well, I love that. And that was actually going to be a question I was going to ask you. And we tend to get into this with the karate masters that we have on, which is, you know, with the explosion of the MMA, how have you found the JKD changing? And I think you've addressed that a little is that there's a whole ground game around it. that's had a light shined on it that functions uh, with the same types of principles. It sounds like. Well, I think that, um, you know, and I got to be careful here. I know because there's, uh, nobody that will support you on your own path more than the JKD community. And there's also nobody that will rush to correct you more than the JKD community. <laughs> and, and I love, I love my people out there, but you know, the, the reality of it is it's my journey and it, and just like it's their journey. And so something that works well for somebody else doesn't mean it's going to work the same for me. Now, what I do believe 
you know, is it, uh, you know, for, for Jeet Kune Do, because it's such a different term for everybody, but ultimately there needs to be a unifying foundation, right? A, a common language that we can all speak. And then from there, you need that experimentation and that mixture. And that's where you really get into the JKD part of it is when you get beyond the foundation and you start to experiment and play with how the foundation intermi uh, intermingles with other stuff. So in the beginning, it was more like Jun Fan Gong Fu, right? The original Jeet Kune Do is Jun Fan Gong Fu. It was what Bruce Lee actually did, right? And it was a huge combination of mixing the trapping you know, with more like kickboxing movements. And I'm being, I'm, I'm super simplifying this right now mm -hmm. because I don't want to go into the whole history. So before everybody, you know, keyboard comment <laughs> warriors me and lets me know how wrong I am, I know I'm simplifying it. Um, but beyond that, right, beyond that time period, you know, the UFC has shown us that like, if you're not clinching, there's a hole in your game. You know, if you're not grappling, there's a hole in your game. You know, if you're not dealing with stuff like that, it's not going to be a kickboxing match. It's not going to be a trapping match. It's going to be some ugly combination of both of those. It's going to lead in two guys hugging on, hugging on each other to stop from the other guy hitting them. That's called clinching. You're going to fall to the ground. So you're going to have to have some sort of rudimentary grappling skill. You know, and I, I just think that, um, I think JKD now has an opportunity to be bigger and more complete than it ever has been before. And so I respect people that, that, you know, even JKD has got traditionalists. They've even got their, you know, original Jeet Kune Do, just the people that train, the people that train just what Bruce Lee did from mm. the time he coined the phrase to the time he passed away. And, and that's good too. I study that material too, but I get, I, I, I change every day. I get older every day. My body changes every day. My body is not fixed set in time. Therefore my art should not be fixed set in time either. Sensei Dofa. I have a question for you, Kent. This thought is uh, occurring to me, and this is something that I've often said. The time that we live in right now, it's my question for you that I'm curious about is what is necessary, do you think, for a person to be able to, on a practical level, be able to defend themselves against an untrained person? And I, I mean, I granted, you know, you can throw methamphetamines, you can throw full force multipliers into the mix, you can throw a lot of things in. But one of the things that I think about is we, we exist in a time where we judge our skill level against training against another person who's highly trained. Like, Correct. that's how we're ranking and progressing. We're throwing ourselves into the mix against these people. Like, we're throwing ourselves into the shark tank every day. It, right. And, and battling against all these other sharks. And my question is when you take a shark out and throw them out against guppies, how much training do they need? Like, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, and I don't want to get super philosophical because I know you're looking for a specific answer and I'm going to try to get to that specific go, answer for you. Go wherever you want, Ken. Yeah. You can go wherever you want. Um, so I'm going to use, I'm going to use jujitsu as an example for this. Jujitsu is not the only art that does this, but it's a common art now that most people understand. So I'm going to use it as an example. And in jujitsu, one of the things I enjoyed about it, and I enjoy about it and still think that this is what makes it at, at minimum jujitsu's JKD philosophy based art is simply that, you know, from white to blue and blue's your first belt, you know, by the time you get to that blue, you should be able to defend yourself against the average person on the ground. If it's a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, you and another person, and that person has no training and you have a blue belt, you should do pretty well. You know, so we're not talking about multiple people. We're not talking about a weapon showing up. We're talking about that scenario. Now, the cool part is, is from blue to black, now that's you experimenting and playing. You've got your foundation. You know, so some guys are going to be heel hook guys. Some guys are going to be back attack guys. Some guys are going to be arm bar guys. Some guys are going to come up with some brand new way of doing a, you know, flying inverted 360 heel hook Kimura triangle, right? Like people are going to figure out all these things and, and that becomes their game. And so it's interesting to me that in most martial arts, they tend to look at it. I've definitely heard this over the years with my teachers. It's like, oh yeah, you don't know what you're doing as a white belt. 
But by the time you get to black belt, it's going to all come together for you. And I really like the fact that you just, you said, no, by the time you get your first belt and then the rest is your own development. And I, I think that that was an important thing right there. And so when I think about that now, I try to go back to like, well, what are the objectives, right? Like, what do you need? And so jujitsu is really identified the grappling portion of what you need. So then I kind of break it down. Like I look at martial arts, like my own curriculum, I refer to as Kaishin Jeet Kune Do. Kaishin just means open mind. So it's just open mind Jeet Kune Do, which is a reminder to my students that don't listen to people that say Jeet Kune Do is fixed in time and you're not doing the, the true Bruce Lee stuff, right? Like you got you to gotta just remember that it's at the end of the day, that's not the guy defending you in the fight. You're defending you. So you better do what you need to do to have the tools necessary when the time comes. And if that's the case, including being in shape for that moment too, not mm. just having the, the knowledge up here, but your body's got to be prepared to do it, right? So then it becomes like, okay, what are the five areas? I identify the five areas as striking, clinching, trapping, manipulation, and grappling. So you need to have, you need to understand fundamentals in all those areas. You know, so like you need to be able, can I throw a hard punch? Can I throw a hard kick? Can I throw a hard elbow? Can I throw a hard knee? Can I throw them hard and can I throw them accurately? They don't need to be fancy. They don't need to be in combinations of 45 shots in a row. But can I put, you know, weapon on target when needed? That's, I would say, an important striking concept, right? Can I defend? Can I develop the reflexes? So many people ignore reflex training. You know, they just practice the motions and cells, but like, you know, are you working on triggers? Are you, are you, are you able to like defend and boom, like the defense launches your offense. They're, they're tied together in your, in your mind and your muscle memory. You know, do you have basic fundamentals in clinching? Do you have a wrist game? Do you have a net game? Do you have a body hug game? You know, do you know what to do? You know, to me, clinching and grappling are, are almost identical arts in theory, right? Because you have all these different positions you have to get comfortable with and understand. And you have to learn, understand how to transition and then you got to be able to either strike from the clinch position, just like grappling, or you got to take them down from that clinch position, which is the equivalent of submitting somebody in grappling, right? So all of these things, excuse me, I got an alarm going off. Uh, if my wife is watching, it's 10 o'clock here. <laughs> it's, a little, it's, a, it's a little game we play. Um, but uh, the, you know, so to me, there are fundamentals in, in every area. So as far as what a person needs, I think they need to have a, a real understanding of their own range. They need to have a real understanding of their own abilities, not a false one. They need to have a real understanding of uh, that a fight means survival, not domination, right? They need to, to understand these things. To me, these are real fundamentals that a person needs to defend themselves. And those are all things that they should be addressed in the beginning of your training, not addressed at the tail end of your rank structure or your training. And I think so many people say, oh, just stick with it until you're a brown belt and then you're gonna see and then by the time you're black, it'll magically come out of you. Nope, it won't. I've been doing this long enough that nope, it won't. You have to train in a way that's going to bring it out of you. I love that. I love that survival, not domination. Uh, I repeatedly in my classes tell my students, if you make it home alive, your martial arts served you well. You did a good job. You trained yes. hard and you got the lessons that you needed. It's not about yes. knocking a teacup off of the top of somebody's head. That's the fantasy that you tell yourself in your mind. The other thing I like that you said, uh, by the first belt, you should be able to do this. Sense of legacy standard and legacy Shiranru is by the time you're a green belt, you better be fucking tough. By the time you're a green belt, you better be better than the average person. If somebody comes up to you and you land with one of your techniques, the fight should be over by the time you're a green belt. Not by the time you're a black belt. By the time you're a black belt, you've, you've increased your ability to make mistakes beyond, right? Like now the moment where I needed to act, I can now, I can, I can make a mistake a little longer and hopefully overcome <laughs> if I might hit that rank. I like, I like that idea by black belt, your ability to make mistakes is much bigger. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Um, Guru Nelson, we, we do 10 questions with all our guests. And okay. uh, I'd love to ask you these 10. Generally, take as long as you like, or 
just kick the answers out and I'll move on to the next question. Um, what is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Mm. Recognizing to not be there before it goes down. Who is the most influential martial artist in your life? Guru Dan Inazano. Who do you believe is the most influential artist of all time and why? I am going to decline to answer that because there is not a single, there's not a single direction I can pick that I'm not worried about what other people say. But if I were to answer that right now, I guarantee you I would be laying in bed and I going, Oh God, it could have been that other guy. Why did I say that? Oh my gosh. Because there've been so many important people that have contributed in different ways. Everybody wants to say Bruce Lee and absolutely Bruce Lee did major stuff, right? hundred percent. But there were lots of people that came before Bruce Lee that were also mixing the arts. I mean, you know, uh, it, 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 was, it was Kano coming to Okinawa, right, that made them go, uh, yeah, there's different systems. Sure, there's Tamarite and Nahate and Shurite. But prior to that, there was just guys doing karate, you know. So it, it, it was a Bodhidharma, you know, who traveled through India and into China and got this whole ball rolling. I mean, we could say that if it wasn't for him. Bruce Lee wouldn't have had anything to do, you know? So I, I just, I think there's influential, I think there's the most important per person of certain time periods more than all time. I, I don't think I'm qualified or smart enough to tell you who the, who the most, who the best person of all time is at all. I was, I'm so disappointed. Yep. I thought you were going to say me. This is the week. <laughs> ah, finally, somebody. You know, Rick, Randy, I'm sorry, Randy. You know what? You're right. I, I even got your PayPal payment to say that. Ah. I totally forgot about it. Sorry. Guru Nelson, um, what excites you most about the next five years of your training? Uh, being able to be allowed to train the students again. Mm. Uh, <laughs> honestly, you know, in the next five years, I'll be – I'll be 47, uh, and I just want to see this place build. I want to. I want to really bring. Uh, I want to see myself get better at things. You know, I I want to see myself get towards my black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, I've got a lot of curriculums that I want to develop even further. I've been working on a Balintua, a blended Balintua curriculum for a really long time, um, and I'd like to see those develop. But ultimately, I just want to. I, I want to bring more people into my life that are super super awesome that pushed me. I have so many people that bring value to my life right now. Um, my students are amazing people. My wife's an amazing person. Uh, I'm, I'm still lucky enough and very fortunate enough to still have both my parents at this time. Um, you know, I've, I've been really blessed and the majority of the people in my life that I've been blessed with came to me through martial arts. So mm -hmm. to me, what I think I'm probably most excited about in the next five years is to see who else is, is it's going to bring to me to see, you know, who else is going to elevate me in my life. I, mean, I, I didn't even know you until tonight, you know, and here we yeah. are. And it's because of martial arts. It, it's crazy. It's crazy how that works. Like we're going to yeah. meet and know each other a bit and have this, uh, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? Uh, you can, you know, change to the left and the mats are on the right. Um, you're, Oh, I think he got cut, I mean, cut out. Yeah, his internet's flaky. And, uh, and it's funny because I said to him, um, can you send me the 10 questions that you asked? Because I can't remember them. <laughs> right? But uh, I, I know, I, so he's going to jump back in. Uh, okay. One of the things he's going to say is, who is your most, fam who's your most famous um, movie star martial artist? Who do you like? Who do I like? Uh, most people that know me know that I hate martial arts movies. I loathe them. I used to love them. I used to, when I was a kid, I could not watch enough ninja movies in the eighties. You know, I mean, Tadashi Yamashita, the black star ninja was one of my first teachers, you know? Um, but today, honestly, I, I see very little of what I look at and go like, yeah, that's the real stuff. You know, today, when I see a lot of fight scenes in movies, I, I feel like I might as it's the equivalent of watching CGI. You know, it's not real.
you know, when I see the high wire act and all that kind of stuff and, and that's great. Uh, but ultimately it doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. You know, now there's been a couple movies over time. That I thought were were well done. I thought the hunted with Christopher Lambert, uh, where it was like a ninja versus samurai thing was from back in the eighties. I thought that was well done. I thought it was well done because the gentleman they used that, uh, played the head samurai, he's a legitimate Kenjutsu artist. Like he is the guy. Um, so he, you know, he, he choreographed all the scenes and he also starred in it, you know? Um, and so I thought that was well done, but you know, I know a lot of people are into the Itman movies and all that kind of stuff. I, I'm not so much, you know, um, I, I, a lot of people say, Oh, you don't like all that stuff. And I say, well, it's, it's a misrepresentation of what the art of Wing Chun is. Cause you're not going to fight for 25 minutes. That's not the goal. The goal is to find an angle, poke an eye and get out of there. Right. right. And so when you, when people come to me saying, Oh, I want to do Wing Chun. I saw the Ip Man movies and I always have to disappoint them because, well, you're not going to do a 25 minute fight scene. It's not going to be like that. So, so I have, I have difficulty with that. So I, I guess I, I guess I don't have one. That's a really long way of saying I don't have one. I'm sorry, Randy. <laughs> no, that's all right. No apologies necessary. Sean's texting me the questions as we go right now. So um, who would you most want to spar with? Uh, or in your case, maybe roll with, spar with, roll with, trade hands with? Um, who's somebody out there that you haven't that you would like to? Somebody that I have I mean, not. It's a hard answer because you've all already uh, – Professor uh, Jean-Jacques Machado, you've already rolled with him, but who else is out there that? You know, I've had, I've had opportunity to roll with uh, uh, Huron Gracie. I have not had the opportunity to roll with Henner Gracie. I'd like to roll with him. I think you know, there's a lot of guys out there. Uh, I'd, I'd love to roll with um, Marcelo Garcia. Uh, you know, he, everybody uh, always sings his praises and I like watching his stuff. And to be honest with you, I just can't figure out what he's doing half the time when I watch him, he's got that micro movements, you know, um, Hicks and Gracie, most definitely, uh, especially now that Hickson is a bit older, uh, because now that he's kind of out of that competition, uh, mindset, he's back to the self-defense side of things. And he's, um, really talking about the invisible jujitsu, the things that are hard to see, the things you have to feel. Uh, I would love to roll with him to understand those feelings because you, you can talk about something all day, but if, if it's a feeling, you, you just don't understand it until you feel it, you know? Um, so he would definitely be, he would definitely be on my list. You know, there's, there's, there's a few out there. What's your, uh, what do you think today is your greatest achievement and do you have any regrets? Uh, sure. I think, I think anybody that says I have no regrets uh, and granted, I know I'm speaking in broad generalizations here, but I think if you say I have no regrets, typically you're, you are either a person that takes no stock or evaluation in your actions whatsoever, or you are a person who is trying to kind of wash over things you'd like to forget. I think it's important to take stock and evaluate um, and, and make the changes accordingly. You know, the, how we behave and, and, and how we interact with people. It's just like training. You know, you get in there, you, you see what punches you can dodge, you see what punches you can block, and you see what punches you eat. And, you know, every time you eat one, you go, okay, could I have dodged or blocked that one instead? You know, what do I do next time? And I think that there's been plenty of times in my life that I've, I've eaten a few punches and said, mm, next time I will behave differently and that will improve my quality of life and improve the type of people that um, stick around me. And how about your greatest achievement? That's a tough one. You know, <laughs> I, know this is a mar I know this is a martial arts podcast and I know that you know, people would be like, oh, is it this black belt or is it this teacher or is it, you know, training that actor or working with those police officers, whatever it might be. Honestly, to me, the greatest achievement to me is when I see super quality people that have been in my life for a long time, because that means I must be doing something right. 
you know, to have, cause these, these are people that wouldn't stick around and deal with BS their whole lives, right? They wouldn't deal with me if I was a jerk. So I must be doing okay there. And the one that sticks out most to me, I've got, I've got amazing friends I've known for decades. I've, I have two friends that go all the way back to like, before I was even a teenager, uh, my buddy, Jimmy, my buddy, you know, my buddy, Joel, my, my buddy, Dennis, uh, they've been with me my whole life, but and this is going to sound strange. I think my biggest accomplishment is my marriage. Um, because that is a, that is constantly evolving, constantly learning, constantly challenging you, constantly putting you in a place where you need to think about the other person. You know, you can't just be autonomous. And I think that the things my marriage has taught me and the approaches that I've, I've failed with and the approaches I've been successful with when it comes to my marriage have easily trickled into every relationship in my life and even the way I teach. So uh, I am grateful for my marriage. I'm grateful for my wife, Lori. I, I love her very much. I would not know. I would be a lost man without her in my life, truly. So I, I, think, I think being able to keep a quality person like her in my life for the last 12 years has been my greatest accomplishment. That's a great uh, accomplishment. Uh, and congratulations to you and to Lori for that accomplishment. I'm, uh, I'm finally in that place too. So I'm finally uh, have reached that accomplishment myself with uh, my current partner, Christine. So uh, nice. um, how about uh, if there was one thing that you've learned from martial arts, and I know Sean's back on the call, but it feels weird to bounce it back to him. But if there is one thing that you've learned from martial arts that every non-martial artist could get, what is that one thing you wish they could all have? Everything changes and you must change with it. You must grow, you must adapt, you must evolve. Not everything will go the way you want it. You got to learn to deal with pain. Pain's a real thing, you know, but pain, pain can be a motivator. Pain can break you down and pain can help you grow, you know? So pain's a part of the experience. If you do everything you can to avoid it, you're also doing everything you can to avoid the growth that comes from it. Truth bomb. I think that's, I'm going to pass it back to uh, Sean. Uh, I think we're going once around the horn here, but I'll leave it to Sean to decide what's happening next. I, I appreciate that sense of fat. Thanks for bearing with me, everybody. And um, to Rogers Cable, thanks for 10 weeks of bad cable. Uh, let's hope we start this. <laughs> oh, I'm not kidding. It's been a Just dance. Oh, I'll, I'll call Just them out. Call I hope them they're out. watching. I hope they're watching. By the way, total side note before we go around the horn. Uh, Guru Nelson, do you watch the show Kingdom? No. Oh, okay, cool. You, you got a beard like one of the characters, and it's an MMA show that's for you guys on Netflix in the States. It's, it's glorious. I'll um, check it out. Yeah, Kingdom on Netflix. It's with Frank Grillo. It's a divine series, but also it's, it's a great MMA show. Um, so yeah, uh, what we do is we go around the horn and we start with Haunchy Legacy and we, we come down the ranks and, and just kind of, you know, say any last questions or thoughts we might have as we wind her down. So Haunchy Legacy. That was an interesting conversation to hear other people's views. That's it. Thanks, Hanchi. Yeah. Sensei Suino. Um, yeah, I, I love this. Um, you know, I've known Kent. I've, all, I've known all of you guys a long time. I've known Kent a long time. Um, um, saying this out loud makes me feel like I'm a I'm another generation of of martial artists. But it's really good to see Kent. You know, with your age and the accomplishments you've had so far, and and the future vector. I say this after every one of these calls. Um, I just feel like the and maybe it's because I'm in martial arts. But the best people in the the best people in the fucking world are martial artists. Um, you know, a lot of us start young and we want to fight or we do stupid stuff. And then, but, but if you stay in this game for 30, 40, 50 years, it changes you in such a profound way. Everybody here has contributed so much and is going to contribute so much to society, to um, toughening people up, to helping people get along, um, to being uh, 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 one of my teachers, Sato Shizuya Sensei, the late uh, Nihon Jiu Jitsu founder said, um, you know, he used to quote the tenderness of the warrior. You know, he said, you can't, it, it, there, there's a uniqueness, there's a unique ability in people that are trained to fight um, and, and, and then develop in that world to also be 
incredibly uh, compassionate and kind. Um, I'm just so stoked to be a part of that world. Um, like you, Kent, I think um, a great deal of the best people in my life all came through martial arts. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on, man. It's been outstanding. This has been an honor. I, I, I appreciate that, the, uh, the invitation, truly. Tenzi uh, Dopan? So uh, there's a bunch of things that Kent said. Uh, Kent, one of the things I do after these calls is I write things down on the whiteboard that were said. And I've written many things down now from when Sensei Legacy was on and Sensei Suino and Sensei Copeland and Sensei Terian and uh, Sensei Burkowski. I write these things down and I just kind of meditate on them when I'm skipping or driving on my motorcycle or whatever. Um, so I want to thank you for coming on too. Uh, before I do that, um, one of the things that's been great is through this, I've met a bunch of people on the internet, um, through Facebook, different people have reached out, uh, and there are some pioneers in martial arts. And one of them is, uh, uh, Carl Pressland. I communicate with this guy pretty frequently now on Facebook, uh, fellow biker and great martial artist. And he, he, this is the message that he gave to all of us. He said, uh, this is just a note to say thank you in quotes. Every one of these calls I join, I learn something, I appreciate something to take away, and I become more humble and thankful to be a student of martial arts on these calls. So something we're all doing is going really well uh, uh, based on those types of comments from those types of people. Um, but you know, some of the things that you've said, Kent, uh, uh, be aware of what you say and do when people are looking up to you right? That uh, you have the potential to do good or bad with your words and actions for other people when they're in the dojo. So I'm going to take that away and I'm going to think about that. Um, <laughs> I really like that, you know, the difference between being a genius and stupidity is that geniuses know there's a limit. Like, <laughs> and stupid people just don't know there's any limit. <laughs> I love that, <laughs> right? Like, it's both funny and profound, like on a, a super deep level. Um, I love what you said tonight about uh, consistency, being a consistent person, being a consistent teacher, uh, delivering the same message when something is not going good, and also being consistent when something is going good. Uh, it was great to hear you talk about conquering your fears. Uh, you know, honestly, I'm not sure I would step out to a uh, role as Jean-Jacques Machado. And uh, it's awesome that that made you feel uncomfortable and then you went away and you beat yourself up over it. And when you had the, the first opportunity you had to fix that, you jumped in there and you, you fixed it. So I'm happy to hear you say that. Um, I loved what you said, survival, not domination. Um, I'm, the fact that you've said it means I'm gonna continue to preach it more and more. I love that, survival, not domination. Um, I loved when you're talking about things being pressure tested. That's something that I've heard Sensei Suino say a lot, you know, that, uh, you know, you can't really have an art if it hasn't been pressure tested. You can't really know, can I, can I strike? Can I clinch? Can I grapple? Can I, you can't know if you don't pressure test it. I, I love that. And the final thing that I'm going to take away is just when you said, it's my journey. I, I love that. It's my journey. Like it doesn't have to be anybody else's journey. And no matter what else that anybody thinks of what your journey is, it's your journey. And I, so thanks so much, man, for coming on here. I so happy to have this page of notes of things to go away and think about. I love being a student and I like learning from people and thanks for uh, teaching me a couple of things tonight on this, this talk. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, Guru Nelson. I just want to wind up. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching, but I just want to say, um, I love, you know, again, being very close in age, knowing that you're down there doing the work. Because when I go, I'm going to go roll tomorrow. I'm going to train on the weekend. Like, I'm, I'm going to be like, oh, fuck, there's another guy down there and he's doing it too. And we're never going to compete. But uh, knowing that you're there, I'm there in 20 years, we'll be the same age, 30 years. And we get to push this thing forward. I really understood why uh, Sensei Suino asked you to be on the call. And, you know, when all this makes more sense, I'd love to strap on kimonos and, and have a roll with you if, if that would be okay. 
I think Absolutely. we'd have a good time with that. Um, so I just want to say thanks, and I want to throw the last word to you. The last word? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> the pressure. It better be good, man. It better be good. Better be good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. This better be good. Oh, man. So I have, the I have the opportunity to blow this whole interview right now, huh? <laughs> yeah. 100% you know, um, final. Well, I think, I think as far as the last word goes, uh, th there's a, there's a, a jujitsu practitioner, uh, a very high-level gentleman named Chris Howder. And um, I was told once that he said, and he didn't say this directly to me, so that I, I, if I'm misquoting, my apologies, but I was told that he said this, and this always stuck with me, um, that it's not who's best, it's who's left. And I always thought like, wow, that's, that's deep. You know, it's, it's not who's best, it's who's left. Because you, know, you see a guy, I mean, like Guru Dan is 84 years old right now. He's 84. So that means he's probably not moving like he's 24, right? Because you can look at him when he was 24, you look at him when he was 44, you look at him at 64, you look at him at 84. And, you know, everybody moves differently as they go through time, but he's still doing it, you know, and he's still doing it well. Uh, you look at Elio Gracie, who was, you know, made all the way up into his 90s. You know, you look at uh, Tadashi Yamashita who's in his 70s. You look at Taiko Yada, who made it to his early 80s. And, and you know, when I look at the people on this, this group right here, none of us are, are newbies. None of us are, we're not new at life and none of us are new at martial arts, right? We've all got some, some time behind us. We've all got some experiences behind us. So I feel very honored to be here with a you know, bunch of guys who um, I don't know if we're best or not, but I know we're left because <laughs> I can think of a lot of people who are no longer training that, I, that I've seen train, you know, that I've started with. And I, I have a real good feeling, honestly, that like when, you know, 40 years from now, whatever it might be, that it's still going to be this group of guys talking. It's still going to be these guys talking about martial arts and, and be like, yeah, remember when we did that, that interview way, way back, you know, and, and that's the important thing. I don't need to be the best guy. I just want to be one of them. You know, I want to be still rolling. I want to be still throwing punches, still swinging sticks, you know? And I, so, so to me, my goal isn't to be the best. My, my goal is to not stop because once you stop, you stop. It's so hard to get started again. Right. So I think, you know, if I get the last word, I think I'd actually like to ask a last question since you guys asked me a bunch of questions. Is that okay? Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would like, if possible, to ask if everybody on this call, whether it's individually or all together, at some point, I would like to ask you to come down to my school please be my guest. And I ask you to teach me something. I want to learn something from you guys. Cause obviously all of you have a, a great amount of experience in your chosen fields. And I just see an opportunity to, to grow here. So I would be, I'd be honored if, if you guys sometime would pass on something to me. Yeah. I'll That's come down point. and teach you some sort. I'll come down and teach you some sword techniques sometime. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> You're on. Um, of course, since Astrino will be with me, he'll be leading that. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Thank you. And, and you know, my answer is obvious. Sensei Dofan, if you could just give us the last housekeeping word about our show for next week uh, so everybody knows what to look forward to. Yeah, so uh, in addition to that, uh, you see that uh, uh, Guru Kent is standing or sitting there in this beautiful dojo. Um, that place needs to be kept up. Um, there's a financial burden that comes with that. Uh, the place that I'm sitting in comes with a financial burden. And while Census Suino is not sitting in his dojo right now, there's a financial burden that comes uh, with being in those places. And if you're on this call and you can somehow go to the GoFundMe pages uh, for these places and help them stay in existence, it's greatly appreciated by everybody. Um, even if you're not ever going to train there again, uh, if you're on this call and you can share it with somebody, a former student, I mean, let's make that shit go viral. Let's get, because these places need to keep going. Like what we're doing tonight is to try and help this keep going, right? 
keep these martial arts schools going, we're adding value to communities that doesn't exist anymore in other places. So um, please support these dojos. And if it's not one of these three, find the dojo in your community that you really align with and help that martial arts school keep going, even if you're not gonna be a member there. Um, but super excited, next week, uh, we're gonna have Hanchi Billy Hines on the, on the talk. Um, I'm afraid to even see him. Like he's such a, he's such a dominant person and uh, um, so highly skilled in martial arts and, and part of North American martial arts history. Uh, I can't even believe that he's gonna be on talking with us, but I'm super excited for him uh, to be on the call. And if you're wondering when I say these things, when Sensei Legacy joined as a white belt, he was already a third degree black belt. And that was back in the, in the 60s. And so, um, you know, this is a person that we definitely want to, you want to hear what this guy has to say about martial arts. Um, and then I'm super excited. We're not taking a break, right, Sean? We're, break. we're going for three weeks after that. Um, can mess all night. We're going to have Hanchi Patrick McCarthy is coming on, another uh, uh, pioneer in martial arts. And then we're going to have Hanchi Chuck Merriman on. And then we're going to have a surprise for the, the week after that. And we'll just leave it at that. But um, might not be as big a name, but the information that comes out might be more beneficial to you. So you might want to join in. Thank you, Sensei Dolphin. I'm so excited for that. And I appreciate it, everybody. I'm taking off to shoot a movie after that. And we're, we're going to keep going with the show. But, uh, but uh, I'm really happy that we're, we're able to figure out ways to adapt through you know, getting into month four, five, six. It's what's really exciting about a growing show like this. Thank you again, Guru Nelson. Everybody, please be safe, be, uh, be good, train hard, and we'll see you all in a week. Thank you, everyone. Night, everybody.